Hello, hello. Welcome back to pre-med office hours. It is Wednesday, July 5th. If you're watching live, this is episode 158. Can't believe we've been doing this for more than three years. Although I feel like I say that every week because I'm still blown away. Uh, we're so happy to have you here. Today is live question and answers with the Med School HQ team. I'm Rachel Grubbs. I am one of the co-founders of MAP along with Dr. Ryan Gray. Um, I have been helping pre-meds throughout the MCAT and pre-med process for about 20 years now. Um, so I'm very excited to have students here to pick my brain. And alongside of me are two of the medical school headquarters advisors. So Dina Galini, our newest team member, uh, not at all new to advising. Um, uh oh, no. we're having, yeah. I have you on ticker. Let me, there we go. <laughs> okay. Nikki <making> non ticker. <laughs> I've seen a banner fight in the background. Okay, Dina Galini, a former senior admissions advisor for Stanford former assistant director of advising at Brown University for their uh, medical master science program. How are you today? I'm doing well. Sorry if I keep freezing um, and have an awkward background, but um, I'm doing okay. Nice to be here. Yeah, we're glad to have you. And last but not least, Christine Crispin. Uh, Christine is a former director of admissions at UC Irvine, um, admissions committee member at USC Keck. How are you today, Christine? I too am doing very well. Thank you. Happy to be here. So before we get into questions and comments, um, and a reminder for anyone watching, uh, whether you're on uh, YouTube, Facebook, whatever, uh, you can post in the comments. Uh, we get questions from a lot of sources. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, let's just talk for a minute. It's July 5th. For people who applied to AMCAS, um, schools started to transmit, or sorry, AMCAS started to transmit to schools as of June 30th, so last Friday. So we are now officially in secondary season. Um, what does that mean to you? What's, what's something that you think students should be considering as we're now officially in secondary season? I'll let you each go. Um, Dina, you wanna go first? Sure. That's a big takeaway for secondary season. Um, I, first, I hope that um, students have started to, um, you know, have pre-written some secondary responses prior to any coming out last Friday. Uh, I think that just general pre-written responses, why medicine, diversity, um, you know, general topics will just get you um, in the right headspace and preparation for, um, you know, the influx of secondaries that's to come. And I think just pace yourself. Um, they're they're going to all start pouring in at once, particularly after this holiday week. And, um, you know, just try to get ahead of as many as possible and give yourself a span of a few weeks um, before, you know, submitting them. Don't have them lingering around and just get them in as soon as you can. Definitely. All right, and Christine, what about you? What's your secondary season tip? I think to add to what Dina said, um, certainly prioritize, get them in as quickly as possible, but remember quality, make sure you are reading the question and answering the question that is asked. Um, pay attention to the words of the question. There doesn't necessarily always have to be an anecdote or a story to answer the question. Sometimes it's a fairly straightforward question that requires a straightforward answer. Mm -hmm. um, so this is not an opportunity to extend, unless they ask for it, to extend your application activities and such. It's really, they have specific questions they want to know. So that's probably my number one piece of advice is answer the question that is asked. Yeah, and if you haven't but... applied, if you haven't applied, please do so now. That you, we're in the next few weeks. They'll start extending interview invites, and the season will continue. So, kick everything into gear a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, actually, um, we had one student that we were advising that got their in a first interview invite from an osteopathic school a couple weeks ago. And um, mm -hmm. someone else who's an application academy who got an invitation on um, over the holiday weekend. Um, 
Yeah. So it's, it's happening. All, so it's happening. Um, and, and so timeliness, it, it is exactly like you guys said, I completely agree. It's managing the timeliness with the quality. Um, I want to remind everyone, if you haven't gotten your secondaries yet and you're hearing us say pre-write and you kind of think, well, what does that mean? Um, pre-writing should be specific. So if you go to secondaryapps.com, I think we had the banner up. Maybe we took it down. We can put it back up. Um, if you go to secondaryapps.com, we have here at MedSchool HQ an entire application essay library. This was updated as of May. So it's all of the essay prompts that were used last year. Now, there are going to be some med schools that change their prompts year to year, but mostly schools do tend to use the same ones over and over. So obviously, if you're getting real live secondaries from med schools, focus on those, get those turned around. But if you're still waiting to hear back from schools, which, you know, again, it's still the week of the holiday, um, um, some schools will send when you aren't verified. Some schools will wait until you are verified. So you may or may not have the officials. I strongly advise that you don't pre-write a general essay. Go look at schools you're applying to and pre-write based on the specific prompts. Because like Christine was saying, one of the most common mistakes that people make um, with secondaries is to write something that doesn't fit the question. Um, so unlike personal statements and activities, you may not have a lot of anecdotes. What you're doing is just reading the question and exactly ask, answering it exactly as written, which is oftentimes a multi-part question. So yes. make sure you're reading the prompt. Make sure you're checking that you've answered every part of the prompt. All right. Let's start taking some questions from the audience. Okay. Billy Raven Roth. Uh, so this is a great one. Billy says, advice for secondaries for people who are retaking or taking the MCAT late in cycle. What do you think about this, Christine? Um, so I don't know that my advice is going to be specific to, to Billy Raymond's specific question, because I think my advice is as, as it stands in terms of answering the question that is asked. But if you are retaking the MCAT late in cycle, so I'm going to presume that you have applied and you are either waiting score one or awaiting a new updated score. Um, I still am gonna advise you to get your secondaries in as quickly as possible. Um, they may ask you a question, something about, do you want to explain anything on your application? Many schools will give you an opportunity to talk about an aspect that may be concerning to you. So if you are retaking an MCAT and you feel that there's a, a strong reason as to why your MCAT score isn't indicative of your current abilities, that might be an opportunity to explain it in that part of the secondary. Mm -hmm. um, I also, if you are taking the MCAT, particularly for the first time and you are um, still studying, you really do have to find the right balance between writing secondaries and studying for your MCAT because both are e both are critically important. So you can't ignore one to do the other. So yep. that's probably my advice for that to the best of my ability to that scenario. Yeah, completely agree. Got it. You got to multitask. Um, if you wanted to do them separately, it, you had to start earlier at this point. If you're retaking or taking now, you just have to have to get them both done at the same time. Yeah. Angelina asks, could I use secondary with, quote, anything else you want to share with us prompt as a why us essay to say why I'm excited about a particular school? You know, we got this question in some other session last week, so it seems to be a popular one. So, Dean, I'm going to let you answer this. The question is, if it's just, is there anything else you want to share? Can I turn it into a why our school essay? Yeah, um, I think that... This, this, my answer is twofold. Um, I think that anything else you want to share with us really does mean like, is there anything else that uh, you did not have the opportunity to list or share um, in any other part of your application? Um, so in your activities and in your um, personal statement that is not highlighted, you know, in the other secondary prompts from that school, um, you know, if there wasn't a COVID 
prompt, maybe COVID really impacted you and your academics and had a huge impact on your pre-med experience. And that's something that you do want to share. Um, I don't necessarily think that this is the platform for why us. Um, I think that if schools wanted to know why us, they would give you a prompt, why us? However, I think that if you have something really specific to say about why this program, um, that your qualifications are tied to it in some way. Uh, let's say you have a lot of experience um, even growing up in a rural area and, you know, working with, um, you know, lack of health care in rural areas and the school has a really heavy focus on clerkships in rural areas that you're interested in. I think tying your background and your experiences to that in the YS essay is fine, but not a general like, I've always dreamed of coming here and it's my top school. No, I don't agree with that. I don't know if Christine would um, agree with me, but I just feel as though if they wanted a YS essay, they would ask YS. Christine? Agree, disagree? Um, I actually agree with Dina um, on this one. I, I think why us in general, believe it or not, tends to get too generic where you search the internet, you search their website and you say, I really wanna go here because I'll use Keck for an example. I really like the training at County and I like this and I like that. Okay, thank you. But I agree that if there is a legitimate compelling something that truly does differentiate or add to why that is truly the right thing for you i think it's okay but it cannot be a regurgitation of what's on the website mm -hmm. um, and remember optional is optional don't feel you have to answer that question because you're going to worry that they're going to give you a bad mark for not answering an optional question optional is truly optional Great. All right. Thanks, friends. All right. Minal says, is calculus needed for pre-med? I did school advanced placement BC calculus. I'm doing statistics in college. So Minal, the short answer is it depends. Um, most med schools require at least one semester of math. Um, some want calculus, some want statistics, some want to see both. Um, a great thing to do, let me see if I can actually turn on screen share here, is to create a free account at Mapped. Uh, you guys can see that now, right? Uh, and if you go to map.com and then go to the med schools list, once you've entered all of the courses that you have taken so far, we will actually do an analysis on the percentage of prereqs that you've completed. So I'll sort of zoom here so you can see these are all schools that the student has bookmarked that they're particularly interested in. So you can see here, um, George, what, um, George Washington, they've got 83% um, complete, so they're missing something. And you can come over here and actually, I'll zoom back out a little, look at the prerequisites that the school requires and see which ones you're missing but you are just gonna need to do your research school by school. Um, there are one or two med schools out there that actually require three semesters of math. Now that's very rare. So I don't mean everyone go out taking three semesters of math, but even though you don't need to finalize your school list really until March or April of the year you apply, and even then you could add more after you submit your primary, that's possible. Um, it's a good idea to, for at least the schools you know you're going to want to apply to, right? You're in state public schools, any schools you've always dreamed about. It's a good idea to go ahead and look at their prerequisite list um, to see if there's anything a little bit unusual that you think, well, I wasn't planning on taking it. And now actually I realize I don't care about that school enough to take it, or I do care about enough that school that I want to fit that into my course plan. And then with all of these here in mapped, um, we always link to the original source. We, we try to keep these as updated as possible, but you know, when in doubt, go look at the actual med school website and we link right to it in the in map so that you can always go back and check right at the source. Um, so that's my advice on that. Life of Psy. Is it late to send in primary applications to MD schools now as of early July? Is it late? 
Uh, I would say it is not late, but it is no longer early. Uh, Dina, you want to weigh in here? I see you nodding. Yeah. No, I, I agree. It's, it's not late. Um, but it's also not as early as a month ago. <laughs> so I, I, you know, you're, you're, I say this, I use this analogy all the time. Um, you're entering the traffic jam mode, right? Where, um, you know, your application is going to take longer to get verified now because there's just so many coming in. So, you know, it might not be, you know, it might be two weeks, three weeks, maybe four weeks, probably not, but probably three um, until you're verified. So at that point, some schools might be giving out interview invites already. Mm -hmm. So you just, um, you know, the later you wait, the longer um, you're, you know, expanding the process in terms of, um, you know, setting yourself back with um, the time that you have to complete secondaries and then just, you know, having everything complete to be eligible for interviews. Get it in. <laughs> ASAP. Yeah. Agreed. Not time to give up yet, but yeah, time don't to give up. Crunch mode. <laughs> All right. William Lynn wants to know, if I failed a class, I got a D and then retook the class at a different school, a community college, due to the class being full at my college, does that matter? This is a very long run and sentence, friend William, um, because retakes don't remove bad grades from AMCAS. Well, okay. So you're, first of all, let's break this into some pieces. So William, you're correct. AMCAS is going to count every attempt of every course you've ever taken. So if you take a course and you retake it, yes, both grades are going to be on the AMCAS GPA calculation, right? So that's, and you will have to submit transcripts for both schools, right? Um, I'm not really sure if I understand sort of what the question is. Um, is it okay to take a course at a university and then retake it at a community college? Uh, that's not ideal, honestly. Um, it's not the end of the world, but it doesn't look that great because there could be the perception that you were going from a four-year university to a community college for potentially looking for an easier way to do the course. Um, that said, especially if the course is a prerequisite, if you have a D or even a C minus, you have to retake it. So again, you say, does it matter? Well, yeah, it matters because you had to retake that course. Um, and the potential secondary could be that you would have to explain that scenario. Um, mm -hmm. Secondary, there are many schools on their secondaries that will say, if you have a grade of a C or below in any prerequisites or even just on your transcript, please explain. And so, you do need to be able to address the issue that happened that caused the initial D and maybe even the reasoning for retaking it at a community college. All right. Bruce says, hi team. Hi, Bruce. Uh, my apps and secondaries are all in. Good job. Well, wait, your secondaries are all in? Wow. wow. Um, Okay, I assume you did a lot of Texas and DO schools. Um, but I'm waiting for committee letters, which won't be here until August. Will schools hold up my app waiting for them? What can I do? Double question mark, lots of stress here. Yeah, Bruce, this is definitely a real sore point for me personally. I have a lot of opinions on committee letters. So I'm gonna let some of our former directors of admissions um, chime in here. Uh, Christine, what do you think? What's gonna happen if he doesn't get committee letters for another month? Um. If your committee letter is the only letter of recommendation, well, um, let me backtrack. Yes, it is going to hold up a little bit. Many schools, um, Irvine was one of them, they would not review your application until all letters that you indicate are due have arrived. So if it's a committee letter and that's the only letter you're waiting for, then certainly that's an issue. If it's a committee letter plus any additional letters, but the additional letters have arrived in the committee letter has not, they're still gonna wait. So you are at the mercy of, of anybody writing you a letter. Um, what can you do? You can certainly gently email the committee and say, I've submitted everything and now I'm in a holding pattern and I cannot proceed. But it's gonna depend on when you got in the queue at the committee to get your letters you know, your whole 
packet reviewed to even have a letter written on your behalf. I don't really know what their process is, but I think this is where Dina can come in. Cause I think that's where her experience is, but um, I hate, to, yes, it, it's going to hold up your application and I'm sorry. Yep. All right, Dina. So we've gotten the point of view from director of admissions. You want to chime in on the yeah. undergrad and master side? Yeah, and um, I agree with everything that Dr. Crispin said. Um, I do, first of all, Bruce, you're not alone. So no, <laughs> just know that. Um, it's not like out of 5,000 applications, yours is the only one that doesn't you know, have a committee letter yet. Um, it's very common. Um, it's also common knowledge for medical schools to understand that um, there is lack of uh, resources in undergrad institutions or post back institutions in terms of um, who's writing the committee letters as opposed to the volume, you know, in relation to the volume of letters coming in. It's just a common thing. Um, you know, most schools will have to write like 250 letters and only have two people writing um, and submitting on behalf of the committee. And so you're not alone. Um, the committee letter process is is in, is intense um, because again, there is such a, a large volume of letters to be written. So every school does it differently depending on where you were in that queue, when you requested the letter or all of your other letters in that are getting attached to the committee letter. Sometimes, you know, you may have requested your committee letter early on, but you're just waiting for one professor's letter to attach. So there are just a lot of variables. Um, and unfortunately, you know, your application is not going to get looked at until every component is complete, but you are not alone. So uh, obviously this is just two people's opinions, but do you, each of you, do you think it's worth it? Um, is it worth doing a committee letter despite the delay? You have to, um, unfortunately. Many schools, if you read the MSAR and you look at their website, if a committee letter is available and you do not get it, you have to explain why not. It's actually, we're, as it stands right now, it's worse for you to not get the committee letter if it's available than to say, I don't want to deal with every, you know, you're already waiting for other people to write letters on your behalf, mm -hmm. but it's actually worse to just say, nope, I'm not doing it. Dina, agree, disagree? I agree. All right. So yeah, bummer to wait till August, but better than the alternative. Yeah, I find committee letters so frustrating because so few schools offer them. So I know I've talked to many people in admissions who say, but the committee letter is such a convenience. It helps us because it's sort of summarizing in one. And yet a lot of people are at schools that don't offer them anyway. Um, and I know there are also, um, to the point you guys are making, there are schools that have committee letter standards that I think are unreasonably strict. You know, GPAs of 3.8, MCATs of 517. When we've all in our many, many years of advising and doing admissions, seen lots of people go on to be successful doctors who didn't have those kinds of stats, but they had other things that were really valuable. Um, so personally, I have a real sore spot with committee letters, but Bruce, I think in your case, you've done everything right. And now you just need to pick up knitting or yoga or something because you hit the hard part of the experience, which is the waiting. Yeah, this is the worst part. Once everything is done, it's totally out of your control. Yep. All you can do is check your email and your voicemail once or twice a day. <laughs> and and your, make sure to check your spam. And your spam. Every day. <laughs> make sure if you have Gmail or well, even Yahoo, a lot of them now have preset filters. So it's not just spam and junk it's promotions forums updates make sure you know how to check your entire mailbox yeah <laughs> also mapped mail <laughs> um that's always a great way to, to go about it mapped mail is the the free map service that lets you uh have one email where we alert you when med schools write you so you can go create that as part of map, your map.com accounts um but yeah you've hit the part hard part bruce you just gotta breathe deep and wait Thanks for asking. Good question. All right, Tawanda, can you get secondaries before the new MCAT gets scored? Yes, you can. So uh, I'm assuming the context here is I'm retaking the MCAT. So if you're retaking the MCAT,
but you have submitted your primary and your primary has been verified, there are some med schools that as soon as they see that you've been verified, and in some cases, now that the transmission is happening, even if you haven't been verified, may go ahead, they have like automated systems in place. So if they're not pre-screening, they may, ahead and go, may go ahead and send you secondaries, which again goes back to someone before was asking if I'm still doing MCAT prep, what does that do to secondaries? You still have to do them, right? You don't, you don't wanna wait and say, well, I'm not getting my, M I'm not even done with my MCAT prep for a month. So I'll start my secondaries then because the clock is ticking. Um, there are a few schools that will pre-screen secondaries or wait for the MCAT, but most are going to go ahead and send to you right away. They're just going to hold your application and not actually look at it until everything is in. So letters of rec or committee letters, secondaries, MCAT score. But that doesn't mean that they won't ask for you to send them in. They're just not going to review it for an interview until everything is in. Hope that makes sense. Old friend Jawad. Jawad's here a lot of weeks. Uh, graduate in fall 2024 and I want to apply in 2025. Is taking the MCAT in April of 2025 cutting too close if applying in June? So this is sort of a sliding scale question, Jawad. And as someone who's been in MCAT prep for a long time, here's my answer. You're planning that far ahead right now. Yeah, I think it's cutting too close. Now, lots and lots of people will do it. Lots of people are going to take the MCAT in April or May or even June. A lot of people are going to make the argument that I'm really busy spring semester and I'm trying to make space in my life for high quality MCAT prep. And I get that. But it means that if for some reason something goes wrong, whether that's I'm not prepared for the exam or I'm totally prepared, but the computer reboots in the middle of the test day, right? Like act of God kind of thing. You're not getting your score back until May. And so if if you end up not able to take the exam or if the score is so cataclysmically off that you're not ready to apply with it, now you've pushed yourself into a late season of MCAT taking. So April's not the end of the world, but my advice for anyone who's trying to apply to in 2024 to start med school in 2025 is you're planning right now, take it at the end of the summer if you can in September, take it in January, take it in March. Because then you get the score back in time that, again, just in the unlikely event that something really cataclysmic happens, you have time to retake without having to delay a whole other cycle or apply very late in the cycle. Um, I know that's not possible for everyone, but that's the ideal. Um, so if you can do earlier, do earlier. James Cannon, I became an Eagle Scout with my religious organization and I'm now volunteering at the free clinic at the same religious org. Could I include that I became an Eagle Scout and wanted to continue to help the org? Uh, I guess I'm not sure of the context here. Are you asking if you can include this in your activities essays? Um, this is, it's a common thing to ask about Eagle Scout. And the challenge with the Eagle Scout is that it is typically a late junior high or high school thing. So uh, putting Eagle Scout in your activities is often not going to qualify because most of the applications ask for post high school or later. Um, now, if you've been doing volunteering since you were an Eagle Scout and you're still continuing to do it, that's an ongoing activity. Um, Christine, Dina, you probably see a lot of Eagle Scouts. Thoughts on this? I see some. I actually agree with what you're saying. Um, James, if so if I'm reading this correctly, you were an Eagle Scout with your religious organization and you're now volunteering at a free clinic at the same religious, religious org. If you are volunteering at the free clinic as an Eagle Scout, that that is your role, then yes, by all means, continue. Eagle, it's a continuing activity. But if you're just doing a completely different activity under the same umbrella organization, I would say they're two separate activities and Eagle Scout would probably not be included. Yeah. All right. Got another one coming? I can see our producer working hard in the background. Maybe I can pick one. Uh, oh, that's our, oh, we've got a little break in the questions. Friends, do you have fresh questions? Feel free to type in more. 
we've caught up real time to the ones that are asked. All right, well, while our audience is thinking about what they want to ask us, let's talk about what comes next, right? So we are in the throes of secondary season. Um, and like we said, the hard part is coming soon because it's waiting to get interviews. Uh, what can people be doing now to aid them with interview prep? Dina? Can you, I'm sorry, you uh, buzzed out for a, a minute. Oh, second say season is interview prep. What can people be doing now if they're, if they're lucky enough to have their secondaries complete? Yeah. What can they be doing to aid in interview prep? I think um, collecting a list, um, an organized list of what types of interviews each school offers um, so that you are prepared and not blindsided. Is it traditional? Is it MMI? Is it closed file? Is it open file? Is it one-to-one? -one? Is it a group format? And just knowing what to expect so that if that interview invite comes in, um, you can look at your calendar and, you know, put in some mock interviews and interview prep um, ahead of time. Um, mm -hmm. So knowing, first of all, knowing what types of interview formats are out there is really important and just uh, making sure that you've done your research. All right. Christine, what about you? What do you think folks can do as they're looking ahead to interview prep? Um, be able to articulate the why. Why do you want to be a doctor? Um, that's going to be a part of the overall interview prep. So Dina answered that one thoroughly. So I'm not going to expand on that. Okay. Um, great. But I think the question of, I think that's the two hardest questions in a traditional format seems to be, tell me about yourself and why do you want to be a doctor? Mm -hmm. Um, and so while I certainly don't want you to come across as rehearsed and memorized, I think thinking in bullet points of things you would want to address um, with the question of tell me about yourself is critical. And I think having a general succinct answer of why do you want to be a doctor is critical because they're still going to assess your motivation. Yep. Uh, and this is a good time to remind everyone, again, I'll turn on screen share real quick, that uh, we do have workshops to help you with medical school interviews. If you go to premedworkshop.com, and maybe Veronica can help me by making a banner, premedworkshop.com, um, we've got a list of all of our upcoming workshops, and you can see that on Thursday, July 13th, we do our first interview prep, how to crush your med school interview. Um, if you're looking ahead, you can see later in the month, we already did one, um, one secondary prep, we're doing another one also later in July. So kind of helping you look ahead uh, for all the parts of your application. Feel free to sign up for those if you're looking for more help with interview prep. Can um, I add one? Can I add one more tip mm -hmm. for the interview prep? Yeah. Um, just make sure that you're thinking ahead um, in terms of where you're going to be to conduct any virtual interviews? Do you need yes. to rent any space in your local library? Do you need to rent um, like a private, you know, a private room in your, um, you know, university or lab? Um, just don't be blindsided and just be prepared. Um, be prepared with what you're going to wear. Um, if you're in another time zone, you know, just keep in mind, um, you know, you might not be able to you know, go to work that day, the day before. Um, so just general, simple things like that to mm -hmm. be prepared. Yeah, and we do have- Can I just add um, one more thing? Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> I was just gonna say, kind of piggybacking off of that, when you're collating your list of the schools and the types of interviews that they are doing, also pay attention if they are resuming in any in-person in -person. interviews. Um, Many schools, I think, are staying remote, but not all. So think about that. Think about what you are able to afford and all of that good stuff. So just part of your preparation, it has to be a little bit of financial knowledge if you have to fly out somewhere to interview. Definitely. Yeah. Paying for a suit, paying for the flight, mm -hmm. potentially paying for a hotel, for food. It yeah. can really add up. Um, I don't think it's fair at all. But the truth is, <laughs> applying to med school Reality. is crazy expensive. Yeah. 
All right, we'll move on. Hayden asks, is it appropriate to use acronyms of the school in their secondary essays? For example, writing EVMS instead of Eastern Virginia Medical School. Tina? I think so. Um, I think, yeah, I don't see why not. Um, if, they, if the school specifically does not use them anywhere though, you know, just, you know, be aware of that, that maybe they're doing that for a reason. And then I would just follow their suit. So if they use the acronym in a lot of questions, um, then you certainly can use them to save time. But it, you know, I think at some point spelling out the name of the school is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, generally my rule of thumb with any abbreviations or acronyms um, or initialisms, right, is the first time you use it, you should spell it out. And then you can put in parentheses, the, you know, so Eastern Virginia Medical School parentheses EVMS. And that way, if you mention it again, you can yeah. say EVMS. Um, that's yeah. typically the best way to handle any kind of um, shortening. And again, all of those shortenings um, should be commonly accepted. So either used by the medical school or, um, you know, it's okay to say OBGYN, B G Y N, right? Because that's a that's a known shortening. You don't want to start creating your own just to save characters. Minal asks, is studying abroad helpful for med school applications? Do schools accept abroad transcripts? Uh, I think, Minal, the question is, what do you think it's helping? Right? Um, Anytime anyone asks me, is something helpful, the question's going to be, it depends. Um, you know, why are you studying abroad? What's the point of you doing that? What are you getting out of it? Doing something alone is not going to necessarily have value because if Dr. Wright were here, what he would say is it's not the what, it's the so what. So are you studying abroad because you're under 21 and you want to be in a country where it's legal to drink and you're just going to party for three months? Sounds like a lot of fun. Not sure how much it's going to help your med school apps. Um, are you studying abroad because you were fluent in a language as a child and you've lost a lot of that language and you want to get it back? It's starting to sound a little more useful. Um, you know, there's, there's different reasons. So I can't say whether or not it's helpful because I don't know what you're doing there and what you're getting out of it. Um, do schools accept abroad transcripts? That part, the short answer is it depends. You need to read the AMCAS, ACOMAS, and TMDS handbooks cover to cover. Um, uh, there are very, very minute detailed rules about when um, transcripts from studying abroad are used and when they aren't. So all of the, all of the applications uh, services will want to see every school you ever attended, but some of them will also want to see transcripts and some will not. Some will include them in, in, in um, calculating GPA and others will not. Um, and I mean, this is something I've studied closely for many years. And my answer is it's way too detailed for me to ever try to answer on a video call like this, right? Like you've just got to go look at the handbook, look at your specific situation and see whether or not yours are ones where the courses would actually count. Can I just say though, a general safe rule of thumb on that would be to maybe not take any prerequisites abroad. Yeah. Um, just to be safe, your prerequisites should be taken at your home institution and then enjoy your trip. Yeah, good point. Tawanda asks, how does the recent Superior Court case affect med school admissions? Um, I assume you mean Supreme Court. Um, yeah, this is a hot, hot topic, friend. Um, you know, and I think at this point, the, the I'm gonna, we're going to talk about this a little bit. I knew this would come up. Um, but what I want to say is everyone here is taking educated guesses, right? Um, Many of us saw this potentially coming. I'm sure that there are med school admissions officers who have been thinking about this long before the case was handed down. But the truth is with something like this, sometimes you do just have to see the way it unfolds before you know for sure. So again, I'm not saying we don't know. I'm saying we have educated guesses and I just wanna make sure that that's clearly delineated versus like, I mean, as always with any admissions question, the answer is gonna be, it's gonna vary school to school, year to year, committee to committee. This one is a particularly sensitive one. Um, 
uh, Christine, I'm going to let you go first on this one. How do you think, how do you, how do you estimate that this case will affect uh, admissions? I have thought a lot about this question. I've been asked this question by my own family and friends. Um, I'd like to believe now, you know, I don't know. I like to believe that it will not change a lot of things that they are already doing because if med schools are truly following the holistic review process and they are looking at an applicant in the entirety, they're looking at their academics, they're looking at where they come from, they're looking at whether or not they're first generation, they're looking at the story that has been given, they're looking at their race, they're looking at their gender. It's all a factor in the entirety. They're not singling out one aspect over the other. So I like to believe that it's already been accounted for and it is still a part of the holistic review. Um, I was curious to see what would change with secondary questions to see if the questions about diversity would increase or decrease. Mm -hmm. um, I do expect that there'll be some schools who kind of ignore it completely. I think there'll be some schools who still kind of do the full review and get the picture that they need to get of the applicant applying. So I think it is going to be very school. It's going to be committee and person on the committee dependent to some degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tina, what are your thoughts on this? I agree. I agree with everything um, that Dr. Crispin said. I think that um, admissions everywhere, medical school, undergraduate, law school, everyone was thinking about this prior to the decision coming mm -hmm. out. So it's not yeah. like um, it hasn't been part of the conversation. I think just following um, any information out there, I know the AAMC has put out a lot of information on you know, yeah. race conscious admissions um, and just reading as much as you can and educating yourself is probably um, you know, something really important to do. But I think it's just dependent on school to school and uh, just see what happens. Yeah. Uh, I want to chime in a little bit too. I wanted to let our two former directors of admissions go, but just as someone who's been doing on the private side, the advising, and also some of you may know I've been doing collegiate advising as well as med school advising for a long time um, as Hestina. And so there's a couple things that I think give me a little bit more hope, frankly, on the med school side than on the collegiate side. So one thing to keep in mind is that with college admissions, especially at some of the really prestigious selective schools, there is a very high percentage of people who are admitted on legacy. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were admitted because they were legacy, but there's a correlation, right? A lot of people who are at those schools have parents who attended, parents who are major, major donors. I don't mean kicking $100 a year. I mean names on building, right? And so, you know, we'd love to say, oh, there's no bias. That's just a coincidence. They're still looking at each applicant individually, but... Money impacts the way people think, right? But med school has never had that kind of legacy admissions process. So I do think that that is one thing in favor of the med school process that they, like there's like we've been talking about, there's already a little bit more of a focus on holistic admissions. Um, the other two factors that give me a little hope, and again, I was very stressed by this announcement. I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to pretend to not have an opinion about it. <laughs> uh, that was a weird double negative. I was very stressed by this announcement. Um, but so in addition to the fact that there is sort of, um, you know, uh, this, this absence of legacy admissions, the other thing is, uh, you know, Christine was saying she thought maybe we'll see an increase in diversity questions, and that would not surprise me. But we've been seeing an increase in diversity questions. 2020 was such a major year in terms of people being aware of inequity, both because of COVID and because of a lot of um, the deaths and the protests that were happening that year at the hands of um, um, uh, law enforcement. So many, many schools have already in the last several years asked for people to talk about diversity, not in the sense of who are you, what's your melanin, what's your gender, but diversity in the sense of how do you think about equity? How are you contributing to a diverse learning environment? Um, how have you identified systemic inequities and what have you done to change it? Really probing questions that aren't about just tell me about your background, but are tell me 
regardless of your background, how you behave. Um, and that gives me some hope. And then the final thing that gives me hope is this year, and again, maybe because they saw this, this announcement coming, the AAMC changed the disadvantaged essay to the other impactful essay, really allowing for less disadvantage just based on finance and allowing for environmental factors. Um, and, you know, and again, at this point, I hope a lot of people watching um, who applied this year have already applied in the primary, but that's what that other impactful was for. That gives you a chance to tell your story. Um, so your story does matter. And again, um, it, it, yes, it's about, I think there are demographic factors. You know, everyone knows that your zip code where you grow up has a huge impact on your education and health through your entire life. Like that's not an opinion, that's a fact. But that other impactful essay gives you a chance to sort of tell your story around those facts. Um, so, so again, uh, I don't know how it's going to go, but I think there is still room for applicants to be considered in, in full. That's what I hope will happen. Me too. Thanks for asking, Tawanda. It's a really important question. Big breath. <sighs> Okay, There's a lot of talking, friends. Thanks for bearing with me. Okay, Jolene Fleur says, a common secondary is to explain your plans for the year. I'm having such a hard time answering this question because I'm a stay-at-home mom to three kids. Should I just write about what I do as a mom? Um, well, I mean, stay-at-home mom to three kids is a pretty intense job. So first, let's just acknowledge that. Um, if you were outsourcing all of the work you did, right, the, the child care, the laundry, the cooking, the cleaning, that would be tens and tens of thousands of dollars. So let's acknowledge you're, you are working very hard this year. And yes, also, they may want to know what you're doing that's helping you prepare for med school. Uh, Dean, I want to chime in here. Yes, thank you. Um, I agree with Rachel. It's definitely commendable to stay home with three kids and raise three kids. So you should be honest and talk about that. Um, I think you also do need to talk about what you're doing to prepare for medical school, because if you are going to enter medical school in a year, uh, how are you prepared for that? Um, are you gaining any clinical experience? Are you doing any shadowing? Are you doing any uh, sort of volunteering? So um, if you're not doing any of those things, because obviously you're very busy with your schedule, um, maybe think about doing something that is connected um, to, um, you know, what you would be doing in medical school. I always like to use that analogy of, um, you know, you wouldn't apply, I mean, you wouldn't try out to be on a basketball team without having practiced basketball for a few years. So I think just making med schools know that you're doing something that is related to, um, you know, being a med school student and a doctor would be important. Obviously not full time with your schedule, but something. Oh. That helps, Julie. All right, what's next? Stick Sun 98 says, I'm curious what y'all think. What would be some reasons why schools send secondaries to people sooner than others? Yeah, we don't just have to think. Yes. We have two former directors of admissions who can <laughs> probably tell you. Christine, you want to chime in on this one first? <laughs> yeah, I'll jump in on this one. Um, okay, so let me just set a stage for you for one second. As the director of admissions this week, just remember, we still are closing out an incoming class. It is still an active cycle. The prior cycle is still active. Weightless movement can still happen. Things are still happening. So you've got to close open and continue all at the same time. So sometimes it's just, they're just slow. I, I, I you know, when I was there, we had an, a homegrown system that you had to like do the internal things to do to get the secondaries even ready. So sometimes it really just takes a minute to get it all together. Even though you know the date, you know what's coming, you still got to get it done. Some schools screen um, applicants. They have internal numbers and metrics that you have to meet in order to get a secondary. So they may not get to you being screened yet, or they've put you in a bucket to be screened by a live person. Um, 
So those are the two most obvious ones to me. It's they're not quite ready to send them out yet because they're still in the midst of the prior cycle or there's a screening process that takes a minute to get some eyeballs on an application to send out the to send out the secondary. Great. Dina, anything different? Anything you want to underline? Yeah, um, I think just the tech part of it. Um, again, using the traffic jam analogy, you know, if you get um, 5,000 um, applications completed, secondaries, everything, um, you can't release, um, oh, I'm sorry, 5,000 primaries. You can't release 5,000 secondaries in the same day because whatever software system a school is using to help read applications, it might crash. So um, <laughs> usually, yeah, usually, you know, releasing any large chunks of data or information in waves is usually safer. So it could just be a whole uh, tech system that's going on behind the scenes. Yep. All right, probably have time for one more. All right. Miriam says, is hospital volunteering enough for clinical experience or should I get a certification? So Miriam, the challenge with the way you've worded this question is we have no idea what you're doing at the hospital, nor for how long or how consistently. Um, so you might be working at the gift shop. I talked to someone last week who has a lot of robust clinical. And then one of her volunteering experiences was working at a gift shop about two hours once a week. She did it for three years, but it was in a really rural hospital. And she said mostly what she did was clean the gift shop in the lobby because she was like, I was just trying to make myself useful and there was almost no foot traffic, right? And so she knew one, gift shop's not clinical. And two, she wasn't even getting like to interact with patient families when they were coming to buy things. Like she was hardly getting any human interaction at all. So she knew she needed to go out and get more robust stuff. But this was a volunteer run gift shop that was only open when volunteers were there and the profits all went back to patients who had trouble paying bills. So she still wanted to do it because it was for a good cause, but she knew based on her specific experiences, it wasn't enough. So I can't tell you if it's enough or not because I don't know what department you're in. I don't know if you're doing admin work or if you're getting great patient experience. I don't know if you did it for 100 hours one summer and then stopped or if you've been doing, doing it consistently every week or every month for the last four years and you're gonna keep doing it all the way up to when you apply. So I think what I'm gonna challenge you to think about is clinical experience is not about being enough for the med schools. It's about you yourself confirming your desire to be a physician. So at some point in your childhood or adolescence or early adult life, you thought, I want to be a physician and I want it badly enough that I'm willing to do all of this work of taking the rigorous courses and taking the MCAT and going through this insane application process. And so getting clinical helps you take that spark of an idea and go interact with patients and patient families. You have good days, you have bad days, you have people yelling at you, you have people crying, you see miracles happen, you see deaths happen. And through all of that, you think, yes, this is what I wanna do for the rest of my life. So when is it enough? You should be getting clinical consistently up until the time you apply. Is the activity you're doing enough? If you're getting those kinds of experiences and you're gonna have stories you can tell in your essay, then you're in the right track. But you have to kind of ask yourself, am I interacting with patients in a meaningful way? That's how you know if you're doing the right activity or not. All right. I think we'll stop there. Uh, it's four till the hour. It's always good to start a stop on time. We end up running late and then we're all late to our next meetings. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming out today. There were some really good, deep questions. I do want to remind everyone, if you're interested in having even more cool question, um, conversations like this, and what's more, having them in person, MAPCON is three months from tomorrow. So MAPCON is the uh, pre-med, pre-health conference that we've been offering every year since 2020. It used to be called National Pre-Med Day. Um, this is going to be our first year doing it live. It's going to be in the Inner Harbor area of Baltimore, which is just a beautiful, beautiful part of downtown, right on the water. Three-day conference, not just for pre-meds, for anyone in the pre-health arena, 
there's going to be suturing workshops. There's going to be panels with people who are pursuing different pre-health careers. There's going to be a lot of schools there. So especially if you're applying this year, you might go to MAPCON, get a chance to learn a lot, network, learn a lot about your future career, and potentially meet an admissions officer who is the person who can go back the next week and look at whether or not you've been offered an interview. And maybe because you impressed them so much, change that from a not yet to a yes. Right. So highly, highly recommend checking out MAPCON. Uh, we hope to see you there. Take care, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>